Well, now I want to turn to Santiago. Uh, Santiago was on the show last week and uh, talked about uh, art and our modeling, and he's back this week. Uh, and Santiago, welcome. Happy to be back, Jim. How are you? Tonight, I'm going to speak about the appreciation of miniatures. That's where that's where I left off last week. And um, let me just say that the appreciation of miniatures is by extension related to the appreciation of scale models. <clears throat> the first idea that I'd like to introduce today is the following. Last June, I had the chance to visit the Illinois Railway Museum um, in Chicago. And um, my very, the, very, the very first reason for me to visit that museum was to meet, of course, 9911, um, CBNQ's E5, Phase 1, magnificent locomotive, my favorite diesel engine ever. And if you've ever had the chance to confront uh, real prototypes or prototypes of the models of, uh, of the models that we have, something in the looking at them becomes very, very different. Whenever we're confronted with these locomotives, presumably the ones we model, you realize or you're reminded of their sheer size, the sense of weight, the sense of, the sense of mass, but more than anything, their size. And uh, you could ask yourself, are they really that big? I mean, compared to a building or to a mountain. And compared to those things, they're certainly not that big, but they seem massive to us. And the reason they seem massive to us is because we gauge our relationship to the prototypes and by extension to our models um, with our own bodies. And that's an important idea. We relate to both prototypes and miniatures with our own bodies. It's not for nothing that uh, when people want to show, for instance, um, a small part that they build for a prototype or a model, they very often take a photograph of the thing on the palm of their hand. In a way, the palm of our hand is um, the measure of the miniature. That's, that comes up very often, often in social media and in our forums, or wherever we um, share contents about scale models. People put things on, their, on the palm of their hands and their shape, they share that picture. The palm of the hand is, of course, the gauge of the miniature. But look, the idea is the following. These things are so big compared to our bodies that looking at them is very difficult, very difficult. You can look, for instance, at um, the face of the beautiful E5 that we have here. That's me in the picture. Sorry for the shameless plug. But um, look, you can look at some details. You can appreciate their beauty. You get a sense of the history of when you're looking at the prototype. And that's wonderful. But if you want to say, for instance, <clears throat> look at um, the rear end of the locomotive or some part in the back, for God's sake, you have to walk all the way back to, to look at um, whatever you're interested in. And that takes a while. It's very cumbersome. These things are big. And so it's very difficult to get a full picture of the prototype whenever you're in their presence. By contrast, with miniatures, you have something very powerful. You look at a miniature, and what you're looking at is something that is as close as we can to looking at the full thing, at the thing in its completeness. In visual language, that's what we call a gestalt, looking at something not by the sum of their parts, but, at, but looking at them as a whole. I have here on my hands a PSC 50-foot automobile boxcar that is waiting for T-section rich Yoder truck so I can model it in Southern Pacific. But look, I'm handling it, and I can flip it around and see every little detail on it. And I get a sense that is not a full sense because there's no such thing as a full vision of something. Um, vision is always mediated or contaminated. But the thing, the important idea is that you get a sense of the whole thing by looking at it when you're looking at a miniature. That's perhaps one of the most important aspects of miniature, of miniatures. Last week I finished with this picture, um, this slide, I'm sorry. And I wanted to meet you halfway where we could see if um, miniatures could reach the level of art. 
I want to talk about two examples. One is um, this one, which is Narcissa Thorne's miniature rooms, which you can find the largest collections of the largest collection of them you can find in the no other than the uh, uh, Art Institute of Chicago. They have something like 62 or 63 of, of her miniature rooms. I'm not going to talk about her because, to be honest, I don't know much about the person. I know she came from money. She was very, very well off. And she was a very courageous woman in the sense that she pursued this enterprise of, um, build, of working with craftsmen um, so that she could build these miniature rooms which ended up in very important museums. Like I just said, the most, the biggest collection, the Art Institute of Chicago. Why are they so interesting? Look, we're looking really at dioramas. They're called miniature rooms and um, they're one twelfth scale and they are absolutely wonderfully crafted. I mean, there's no question about it. These things are nice, they're beautiful. Um, and a lot of things have been said about them that are very interesting. There's some, um, um, scholar, scholarly work done on them. Uh, you can find articles and light about them. But um, I would say that, look, these pictures, even though they seem very easily accessed and immediate to the eye and there's no much thinking about them, they're beautiful, they're engaging, they're attracting, uh, very attractive. Um, they're very considered. Uh, clearly, Narcissa Thorne was a, a woman with a very educated eye. And these miniatures have something in them that make them quite, quite special. They have, for instance, a great, a beautiful sense of continuity um, in the sense that the eye can wander throughout the space, moving from, from part to part, from figure to figure, to from area to area, without falling into, into any sort of sense of disbelief. Uh, they really have a degree of illusion that is wonderful. And let's not forget that the idea of continuity, that's a property that is almost usually assigned to, almost always assigned to surfaces. And a surface, uh, like I was saying in my first um, segment, is a property that, um, or a characteristic that is better related to painting than to sculpture. And of course, since these are dioramas, they are frames, so you're looking into something um, as you do with a painting. The sense of continuity is beautiful, but they're also complex in the sense that, um, you get a lot, for instance, when it comes to the idea of surface perception and the idea of contour perception. Look, um, they're very, very well done. The, the, the surface of some objects, even though they may be within the same category like pots, they may be different. Some are dented, some are shinier, some are, um, you get a sense of, of a real history of the object being behind. That's one thing. The other thing is that even though they're called miniature rooms, they don't read as miniatures. And that's fascinating. That's fascinating because you go to the, to the permanently displayed room in the Art Institute of Chicago, you stand before the thing, and um, you feel like you could go into the space. You project yourself in the space, and you don't feel like you're looking at a miniature. So there's a beautiful ambiguity with a, a very complex perceptual idea behind it uh, that I think makes for a very interesting image to, to sort of study. Attached to that idea, there's another wonderful idea that I think we can all relate to when we look at our, uh, our own scale models. And that is the idea of the viewer moving between worlds. As a viewer of scale models and miniatures, we do that often. We're on this side on the layout. But at the same time, we're on that side on the layout. We're on the layout. We're in the layout. And we project ourselves into these spaces back and forth as we engage with them. That's a very interesting and sophisticated idea. Miniatures do that. Painting does that to, uh, to some degree. But here, the idea becomes um, ever more evident. And that's something. Um, let's look at another example. I mean, you can, you can find uh, her work online. There's uh, a lot of pieces written about her. And um, the, the examples of her miniature of, of these uh, diorama boxes, you can find them um, quite easily. Something about the miniatures that also comes up with her work is this idea of an enchantment. Enchantment is a word that comes up in the literature of miniature mechanized artifacts. 
Um, there's a very interesting idea about, for instance, um, mechanical watches. And there's a red line between mechanical watches and our trains too, but that again requires more time for it developed. But the idea of something enchanting, meaning that it attracts you to the degree where you lose yourself in it. That also happens with the work of Narcissa Thorne, and it of course happens with uh, some of the most detailed and well-crafted um, scale models that we so love. So that idea of enchantment is also, from the human standpoint, very important when we engage and appreciate miniatures and scale models. Let me go back um, for a second. Um, let me talk about this one uh, just um, a little bit more. Because there's an idea in her work that I find fascinating. And when I read about this, I thought, yes, that's exactly what we do when we look at a scale model. Since we actually peek into these um, beautiful dioramas and beautiful, beautifully crafted images, depictions, we engage in a kind of vision that has to do with the daydream. <clears throat> And that idea of daydreaming is, of course, something that we do with our scale models, too. We're looking at something that it's not there. That idea of daydreaming is also attached to a form of vision that has to do with a metaphor um, that, in a way, comes from the sciences. But I think it has a lot of human aspects to it, uh, certainly a childhood aspect to it. And that's the metaphor of looking through a microscope. Whenever we engage with a scale model or a miniature, we're looking at it as if we were looking through a microscope. That metaphor, I think, resonates with everyone. And I read about that and I said, yeah, that's exactly what we do. We find a world within a world. That's our layouts right there. And if you look, for instance, at cab, cab interiors or the interiors of a beautifully detailed passenger car, nowadays, for instance, brass steam engines have the most detailed cab interiors. Um, the instrument, instrument panels light up. Um, the, the seats are perfectly rendered. The cords, every valve is there beautifully depicted. You pick into one of these cab interiors and you're looking at a world within a world within a world amplifying the importance of the, of the metaphor that I was just speaking of. So again, from the human side, the engaging of miniatures has to do with the idea of day wonder, of um, daydreaming, I'm sorry, and wonder. And I think everyone um, relates to that or recognizes that as true. When it comes to her work, really quickly, they're not simply historical depictions. They're not really historical representations. There, there was actually a lot of play between what was historical and what was kind of a whimsy. But what's interesting is that the work herself falls more within this idea of fantasy and the dollhouse than to a simple historical um, depiction of, a, of an interior room. Yes, there's interest, for instance, coming from uh, architectural history and design history, but there's something about them that make them something more of a simple um, architectural and, and, and historical depiction. They really are uh, dreamy and interesting. And of course, when it comes to people going to the museum, there's, the museum has no embarrassment in um, conveying that there are some of the most visited rooms in the entire collection. Now, let's find a, uh, let's look at another miniature artist, so to speak. And that I think a lot of people here recognize. His name is Michael Paul Smith. Michael Paul Smith um, became very famous for making photographs of his work with miniatures, depicting a kind of fantasy um, American town called, called Elgin Park. And he had a Flickr account. He, he passed away a few, day, uh, a few years ago. But he was a wonderfully clever artist and miniaturist. And his work... Um, I would describe as a very clever and sophisticated exercise in forced perspective. What you're seeing here is a, a kind of a table or a base where he would lay miniature cars, I think they're 120, 135 if I'm not mistaken. And he was very clever and educated when he came to laying a, a base where he would model miniature cars and sometimes train, sometimes 
trains too. But he would place them in such a way that um, from the point of view of the camera, there would, be, there would be a beautiful continuity between the depiction and the real world. And of course, as you can see from the pictures, the, the, but the previous one was he uh, making a joke uh, on his Flickr account. Clearly, that's not the work. He was just um, sharing a, a post with a lot of humor in it. But here, this is one of his, um, of his uh, works. Let's remember that miniatures are not simply the three-dimensional ones. They can come in the form of books, and they can come in the, they can come in the form of painting. But in his case, the work is actually photography. He worked with miniatures, and the work was photography. Santiago, I hate to do this, but your time is up. All right. Um, can I have five minutes? Uh, sure. Thank you. I'm going to go really fast. Um, I'll just speak about this one really quickly. Look, in this one, he was doing something remarkably clever. He was using the edge of the base that I was speaking about as a kind of mechanism for forgetting. So in a way, he's using the abyss between the base and the real world as a connecting uh, feature where you would forget that the, the thing being depicted and the real world were two different things. That was, of course, a different view from the first one. I don't think I'll get to speak about this one because there's not enough time. But um, I just wanted to show a, a photograph of one of my O-scale models. There's just no time, so I'll leave it at that. I wanted to finish with um, a sculpture by uh, an artist called Charles Ray. I'm perfectly aware that I challenged the idea of these things being sculptures. Uh, but this work, I think, was uh, a very interesting way to finish that um, conversation of a work that is full size. I mean, it's the size of a truck, but the depiction is clearly the depiction of a toy. I'm not gonna say anything about it because I think people can draw their own conclusions, but in a way it tells you how far away we are when it comes to the problem of scale, model, scale models and contemporary art. And that has to do, for instance, with the notion of what it's a, what's a problem in both disciplines. In our case, the problem is sort of given. You have to model this car in this time frame with these colors and these vehicles, and you can put in this or that train. When it comes to a, to a problem in contemporary art, that changes between artists. It's not a fixed problem. And oftentimes artists have a hard time verbalizing what is it that they're interested in. But I thought that this was a thought-provoking example to bring to everyone's attention. And um, I'll leave it at that. Thank you, Jim. Santiago, I'm really, I, I, I love what you're talking about. I love the examples that you're giving. And you're most welcome to come back and continue this if you'd like to. I'm sorry that I have to uh, to call time tonight, but I thank you so very much for, for doing this for us. Happy to do it. I'll finish next week with um, a quick conversation of um, scale models from the sciences, engineering in, in particular. Thank you. That, that sounds great. Thank you so much, Santiago.